who's going to tell us about how to learn low dimensional functions efficiently. Ludovic, thank you very much for coming and for opening uh, the conference and take it away. Thank you. I want to thank a lot the organizers. I've had a lot of fun uh, the last times I went here, so I'm very happy to be a speaker this time. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, the work we did with uh, all the students in the group, as well as uh, Bruno, who's now at, in Paris, about how to learn uh, low dimensional functions efficiently. So the first thing to know is what exactly we want to study. And the goal is to study what we call feature learning in, uh, at first, uh, actual networks, because as you all know, actual networks, they do work very well. They can uh, generate images in about uh, 10 seconds. They can, uh, there's a whole plethora of uh, large language models that can do a lot of stuff uh, better and better. But when you want to uh, dive in a bit and understand exactly what happens under the hood, you get very uh, stuck very fast. And so uh, the goal is to understand what they uh, do well and to try to replicate that in lower uh, complexity models to try and understand exactly how this happens. And one thing that they do very well is uh, so-called feature learning, which is the ability to represent some kind of high dimensional data and to find an inherent low dimensional representation of it without losing much in uh, the process. So for example, this is a uh, word to vec which is uh, inherent in a lot of uh, language processing applications. And so what we wanted to study was a supervised version of this feature learning uh, task where I have uh, some inputs that are gonna be Gaussian for this talk, so uh, Gaussian isotropic and have uh, labels that are a deterministic function of x. I could add noise, it's not gonna matter much for the rest of this talk. And I'm gonna assume that this target function f star is not any function, but it actually has some kind of low dimensional structure, which means that f star of x only depends on x through a few uh, privileged directions w star. So I have k vectors, uh, w star one to w star k. And the, the labels y only depend on uh, the projection on, of x on these vectors. And the main question that we want to ask is, does the network that we will consider understand that there is something low dimensional about this task, or does it just stay in the uh, function fitting regime and not learn anything? And the network that we are gonna consider, it's just a very simple one, it's a two layer neural network, so you have uh, the uh, first layer weight, which, which is gonna be this uh, big uh, mess of cables in, the, in uh, the left, and then the second layer weight, which are gonna be uh, giving us our estimator. And it's just a fancy name for the estimator of uh, this form, where we have P first layer weights that are gonna be uh, multiplied to, uh, the, there's gonna be a dot product with, uh, the, between X and the first layer weight. Then there's a nonlinearity applied element-wise. And then there is a, a second layer weight, the AI, that are gonna uh, combine to form a single scalar as our estimator. And it's something that's been extremely well studied. And for a good reason, it's because basically it is very different from a one layer neural network, which is basically linear regression. In the sense that it begins to be a very rich, it's a non-convex problem of optimization, so you have a loss landscape to study, you have uh, the weights that you're gonna end up in are gonna be depending on the algorithm that you choose, there's not one minimum as in convex problems. But still, it's two layers, it's not uh, 50 layers, so it's somewhat tractable. And in this line of work, the first thing you can try to do is actually uh, only uh, fix the first layer and only train the second layer. It's called uh, random features. It's been very well studied. I could spend a two hour talk on random features. But uh, the gist of it is that uh, first, it's very bad at understanding structure. It's not gonna understand well that F star has this kind of low dimensional structure. It's just gonna fit it by uh, brute force, basically. And you need a lot of neurons to do that. If you want to learn a degree Q polynomial, or a degree Q polynomial approximation of my function F star, I need both D to the Q uh, neurons and D to the Q data, which is far too much. I don't want to use billions or trillions of parameters 
uh, to learn a cubic polynomial. On the other hand, uh, if we train the first layer, the thing that we hope is that uh, our first layer weights will align with this kind of low dimensional structure in our function. And then the task given to the second layer weights are going to be to fit the low dimensional function h star, which is a k dimensional function instead of a d dimensional function. And so it would be effectively reducing the hardness of our problem from a fitting a function in d dimensions to fitting a function in k dimensions, which is going to be much easier. And so to train that, uh, sorry, uh, to train that, we on actually uh, will focus on uh, the one dimensional model. So I'm just going to take a one dimensional, uh, one uh, so-called so -called single index model where I have only one privileged direction W star. So my label only depends on the scalar product between X and uh, this W star. And so basically the only thing I need to track is the so-called overlap, which is the scalar product between uh, the weights of my network and uh, my weight W star. And it happens, it so happens that in a lot of cases, the, the dynamics completely decouple, and you can consider that your network is only one neuron that I'm gonna call uh, W. So I just need to track how my only neuron aligns with the only uh, privileged direction W star. And there's two uh, phases in this scenario. The first one is that uh, at the start, the overlap, if both are chosen basically randomly, you have an overlap of one over square root of D. It's a uh, standard uh, concentration result, basically. And you need to go from there to at least some kind of fixed quantity. You need to align epsilon or eta uh, with uh, the target direction. That's what we call weak recovery. It means that you've understood that there is something happening, but you haven't perfectly fitted it yet. And the second phase is that you go from uh, this uh, fixed number eta to whatever uh, limit you're gonna end up at. And the learning algorithm that we will use, and that is used at, at, in most uh, theoretical works, is the so-called one pass SGD, where at each step, you take uh, one new pair that you've never seen before, so you can consider it IID with everything after and everything uh, before it, and you take uh, one step of gradient descent. Uh, there's an abuse of notation. There's a, a, an eta that is different from the, the previous one. Uh, and uh, you take one step of gradient descent in the direction given by uh, xt and yz. It happens to be uh, very fast because at each step you only need to compute uh, one gradient over uh, one sample. It's easier to study than a full gradient descent usually because you don't have this kind of dependency issues. And it has good convergence and generalization guarantees. And in a lot of cases, for what we use in regression, so the square loss or the so-called correlation loss, it's important to notice that our gradient is going to be linear in Y, which means that uh, if I compute my gradient, there's going to be Y times some big function of uh, X and W and whatever. But it's linear in Y, and that's what we call a correlated query because we only have access to our labels Y through this kind of uh, multiplication setting. Why do we focus on the search phase? The reason is that uh, once we're in the so-called ballistic phase, once we have achieved this kind of uh, positive overlap, we have very uh, good deterministic descriptions. I can just uh, study my network through uh, running an ODE, and I will be man managing to track whatever it ends up at. So this is, for example, like different ODEs for the, uh, my network at different levels of noise on the labels. And again, it's been very well studied, also uh, sometimes our, our group and you have very good guarantees that if we end up at positive correlation, you will be able to track the network until convergence easily. So it's not a problem. But if you look at the search phase, it's much, much noisier. I cannot have a good deterministic uh, approximation. I, I tried to, there is a line that is uh, like some kind of OD that I tried to run, but you can see that there is a lot of noise around it. And it's an issue because it's actually in the search phase that you will spend most of your time. Ballistic phase is basically easy. And the search phase is the one that your network uh, will need to work a lot to achieve. 
So it's both the hardest to study analytically and the most interesting because it's where everything happens, basically. And in the search phase, a very important quantity that's been discovered by uh, mostly uh, Ben Arous et al. in 2021 is the so-called information exponent, which was generalized to the leap index for uh, multi-index models. And it's basically noticing that depending on your link function h star and of some specific properties of it, you're going to learn much slower for some h star than some others. So for example, there is a function with leap index one in green, two in blue, and three in uh, red. And you can see that your overlap m between uh, the, 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 your network and the privilege direction is growing much slower as the information exponent increases. And if I want to define this exponent, I need to introduce what's known as the Hermit decomposition of uh, my function h star. So I can decompose any function that is uh, Gaussian integrable, which is not a very strong condition, as a sum of uh, Hermit polynomials, which are orthogonal polynomials for the Gaussian measures. And this decomposition is going to have a bunch of zero coefficients and then one non-zero coefficient. So for example, I, I can have a C1 equal to zero, C2 equal to zero, but at some point it's, it has to be non-zero. And I call the information exponent of H star the first in the index in this sum where uh, the coefficient is non-zero. So it can be anything between uh, one and uh, plus infinity. And if you look at uh, what happens, to, what it does to your loss, it basically measures the flatness of uh, the landscape that you're looking at around this point m equal to zero, which is the one that you're starting at in high dimensions. So it is important because the flatter the landscape is around you, the harder it is to escape it. And the main result that uh, was proven by Ben Arous is that it is actually a strong condition for uh, this kind of one plus SGD is that if my function uh, H star has leap exponent uh, L star, then I need at least uh, D to D L star minus one samples to achieve weak recovery. And it's sharp. They show that uh, you achieve, you do achieve weak recovery in uh, D to D L star minus one up to log factors. Uh, except for when L star is one where you still need at least D samples. You cannot do it in like two. It's already a big improvement over the random features regime that I uh, described because first you need only one urine. This is only uh, one urine to achieve uh, weak recovery, whereas before you needed also trillions of neurons. And in general, for a polynomial of degree Q, we always have uh, that its uh, information exponent is less than Q, so you're good to go. You've improved over random features. And uh, if you want to go to some kind of information theoretic lower bound, you can do what's called known as the uh, correlated statistical query lower bound. So it's a lower bound on many algorithms that will depend on this kind of correlated queries. And you can show that you can actually improve on the SVG bound by Benarus, but it's still going to be governed by this uh, L star over two, uh, by this L star exponent. You go from L star minus one to L star over two by doing like a weird algorithm with a modified loss a uh, very specific thing, but uh, it's still going to be governed by this L star exponent. And so the question that we want to ask is, can we do better? Can we do better that, uh, let's take, uh, let's forget uh, the CSQ lower bound and take the classical SD algorithm. So you need D to the L star minus one sample. Each step uh, takes you uh, d, uh, fact, uh, d, order D computation. So you have a total sample complexity of, a uh, total time complexity of uh, D to the L star. Can we do better than that? And the first thing that you can try is parallelize. Why? Uh, so parallelize it is basically doing uh, what we call large gradient steps or large batch gradient steps. So instead of taking one single sample at each step, you take B samples. So where B is large, it's polynomial in D. And you do, you compute the gradient instead of one sample on this whole batch of B samples. And it's very good because if you look at it, it's just a sum. It's just a sum, so you can compute all your gradients individually in, paral in parallel, and then uh, some average them by some kind of uh, Gaussian algorithm or whatever, whatever you want. But it's gonna, it should be much faster than computing B steps of gradient sequentially. And it also works well with some kind of uh, decentralized or distributed learning where everyone has their own data because they can just compute their own gradients by themselves 
and you just need to do like a few of these large steps without too much communication to um, achieve this kind, to achieve uh, the, the algorithm that you want to do instead of having to communicate a lot with them because usually in these settings, communication is also expensive. And the results that we got is first asking, okay, what if you are very greedy? You don't have any time in front of you. You want to be done in one step. So you want to do, use all your data in one big step and ask, okay, what can I achieve? And the main takeaway is that you kind of lose a bit. You kind of lose a bit because instead of needing uh, d to the L star minus one sample, you need d to the L star. And uh, it is sharp. We, we can show that you need it. And uh, after d to the L star, you are uh, able to correlate with uh, the hidden vector. And interestingly enough, you also need to take uh, the learning rate scaling with uh, d going to infinity. So you take, not only do you take very large step, steps as a batch size, but also you are taking very big steps as a distance. So it's really taking you a whole across the landscape to uh, your end point in one go. So it's not, it's not too bad, you lose a factor of d, you gain a lot because you've parallelized, but maybe sometimes you don't have that many samples, so maybe you want to uh, be a bit less greedy and actually accept to do many uh, steps. So what if you do multiple gradient steps? Then, unfortunately, you cannot uh, beat the uh, sample complexity of uh, one single pass SGD, which means that uh, if your n times t, which is the sample complexity of uh, your algorithm, is less than uh, d to the L star minus one, then uh, you, will, uh, you will not be able to correlate uh, well with uh, your target. Yes? Can I just, just ask, are you reusing samples here, or is it sort of several steps with the same? Uh, no, it's a, new, it's a new batch that it's to them. <laughs> I really like, I uh, split my data in batches uh, completely independent. And fortunately, it can be done in that, okay, I can take uh, batches of size d to the kappa with kappa uh, big but not too big. And in this case, I will be able to achieve uh, the optimal sample, sample complexity of uh, d to the L star minus one up to some polylog factors. So it's good because if I take kappa very close to L minus one, my uh, time t will be of order, it's still going, going to grow to infinity, but it's gonna be much less than uh, d to the L minus one, so I should win a lot in time complexity. If you look at uh, the recap of what I've just said, for uh, SGD, you have uh, steps that are taking you D uh, computations, and you take uh, D to the L star minus one of them. For one step, you do only one step, but you need D to the L samples. And for uh, the uh, happy middle, which is uh, large gradient steps, but not too large, you are able to uh, still improve a lot on the time complexity and not lose on the sample complexity. Of course, the time per step of D for one step and T step GD assumes like perfect parallelization, you can do everything well. In general, it's not gonna be exactly D, but you're still gonna win over uh, the single pass SGD. So it's good because we did uh, manage to beat the uh, time complexity. We still have an issue with the sample complexity though. And uh, why is that? Because everything is basically always the same. You, read it, you can write your update equation, we can compute the expectation of our gradients at time t, and show that they obey some kind of finite difference equation, where mt plus one is mt plus mt to the L star minus one plus some noise. And so we can solve this uh, finite difference equation to get the uh, time of convergence, the time of uh, weak recovery, but only if we can actually control this kind of noise. So basically, it's gonna be a choice of, can we uh, choose gamma such that uh, the noise is controlled, but we want to choose gamma as big as possible because we want to make steps as big as possible. So it's a bit of a game. And as it happens, when you increase the batch size, it decreases the noise in the gradients because you are averaging over uh, more randomness. So we, you can increase gamma, but as it stands out, uh, these two effects uh, perfectly cancel out each other. And so you're stuck with the sample complexity even though you can, increase the, you can decrease the time complexity. But still, can we do better? Is it actually uh, 
hard limit or uh, is it, is it uh, just uh, some kind of technical problem? And actually, when you think about it, information exponents, they shouldn't be this kind of hard limit. Because first, they don't have much uh, intuition, except for like, this kind of flatness for uh, square SGD. They don't have this kind of uh, intuition as to why they are hard to learn as a generic thing, not only with SGD. Because like, I could perturb them a little bit and again, get a completely different sample complexity. And second, they are unstable to this kind of transformation. Let's say that I have my H star, which is uh, Z cubed minus three Z. So uh, I know that this has uh, information exponent three, so it's gonna be hard to learn, I will need D square samples. But if I knew that this was the function, I could just uh, square it, and I would get an information exponent of two. So just by squaring my labels, I would uh, manage to uh, gain a factor of D on the number of samples I need to learn, which is weird. I shouldn't be needing to, needing to do that myself. I shouldn't be needing to have this much information about the problem to learn it. And so you might want to uh, think, okay, is this really a hard limit or is it just like some kind of feature of the problem? And very recently, there's been a few intuitions as to why this is not the case. The first one is that if you move away from uh, the CSQ uh, framework to uh, low degree polynomials or so-called statistical query fr query framework, then the right measure of complexity for this kind of uh, single index models is the so-called uh, generative exponent of H star, which is much, much nicer. Basically, it's always less than two for any polynomial. I don't have this kind of ZQ minus three Z that has uh, information exponent three. Everything is at most two. And uh, to construct everything, anything that has a uh, generative exponent above two, it's basically uh, ad hoc construction with ODEs. So uh, most functions that you do in contrary practice have a generative exponent at most two, so it's much better. But still, the algorithm that they use is a very ad hoc algorithm, so it's not very useful uh, if you don't know that you have a single index model. And the second uh, thing is a paper from our group that showed that for some functions, including this uh, bad function that I've been talking about, ZQ minus 3D, you can actually achieve weak recovery by doing two steps of gradient descent. You, you do full batch gradient descent, but this time you repeat uh, the batch, and in two steps you've achieved weak recovery. So it's only for some functions, it's, uh, there are some conditions, but still it means that in some cases just two steps of gradient descent, which is supposed to be bad. Gradient descent is supposed to be worse than SGD, and still uh, it's much more efficient in sample complexity in this specific setting. So, what about SVD or SVG type algorithms? And uh, motivated by this paper, we thought, okay, let's actually uh, do what uh, the gradient descent algorithm just did. And uh, this time we repeat the samples. So uh, this time the first thing that we do is uh, that we first move a bit in the direction of the gradient for our sample. So with uh, some uh, learning rate rho. And then, we take a second step, but this time we uh, repeat the sample X and Y. So it's a convenient uh, proxy for actually uh, something that's been used in practice a lot. Uh, you might have encountered it for, uh, under the name uh, extra gradient methods if your uh, row is positive. Uh, So-called sharpness aware minimization or some if rho is negative, or in general, it's part of the class of so-called uh, look-ahead optimizers. <coughs> so this is something that has some kind of uh, practical viability. And uh, what we showed depends on something that is very close to the generative exponent of uh, Damian et al. And that is kind of solving the problem that I was telling you about, is that it's a new kind of information exponent, but this time you are allowed to transform your labels. So the thing that I was talking about where if you square your labels, you can decrease the information exponent, it's kind of baked in this definition because I, I'm minimizing over all polynomial uh, transformations of my output. The main difference between uh, our definition and the one of Damien et al is this kind of restriction to polynomial functions. They, they don't have it, they have uh, any measure, measurable transformation. But it means that I cannot just uh, decrease my generative exponent by uh, cheating and uh, transforming my input weirdly. 
And what we show is that if uh, we uh, choose our two learning rates nicely, then uh, our SAM algorithm, our uh, look-ahead algorithm, actually is governed by this uh, new polynomial gener generative exponent instead of information exponent, which means that if it's one, we have uh, d samples to learn. If it's two, we need d log d. Probably if it's uh, three, et cetera, it's just that the computation gets messier and messier. And since uh, also all polynomials have a polynomial generative exponent at most two, this time we can learn any polynomial in d log d samples. We don't have this kind of uh, z cube minus three z uh, issue. It's everything in uh, d log d samples at most. It matches some kind of mo much more involved algorithm to learn this kind of low dimensional polynomials such as uh, algorithm by uh, Chen and Mecca. And uh, it is something that we also see in simulation. So if we take functions that have uh, equal uh, generative exponent and uh, information exponent, you see that the two algorithms are uh, perfectly uh, happy. They both converge, uh, they both uh, learn the, di the direction very well. But if I take functions that have a generative exponent much lower than their information exponent, then I can see that my repeated sample algorithms work very well, and my uh, SGD, my vanilla SGD, is completely lost. Sorry? Yes, I could use batches. Uh, it's just that. Uh, no, no, basically, not that we know that batches are, don't beat the sample complexity, we just uh, do one pass for simplicity. And what happens under the hood, because it's very important, is that when you compute the gradient uh, at time t of your function, it is actually aligned with xt. It's just like some scalar that is uh, depending on your label, your uh, input, etc. but it's aligned with your input. And so the second time you encounter it, since there is this kind of, uh, scalar plug wt times xt, it gets simplified because you have a more significant uh, portion of your gradient towards xt. So uh, you have a new term in this. And whereas before you only had this one term yt that was struggling to uh, improve because it's a, it's a linear transformation, I was, as I was saying, this time you have yt both in a linear and in a non-linear setting. And this kind of uh, nonlinear apparition of uh, YT allows you to be much more expressive and to improve a lot uh, your learning. And why is this important? Uh, because it means that something is happening not only in our case. Uh, what I claim is that the first time we encounter XT, we uh, store information, the gradient stores some information uh, about YT, about the correlation between YT and XT, basically in xt. And so the second time I encounter it, it amplifies the signal and allows me to learn. And so, intuitively at least, this shouldn't be only uh, reserved for uh, the, my, my kind of very weird uh, repeated sample even though it's, uh, even though it's uh, viable. It shouldn't be reserved for that. It, it means that the classical justification for SGD which is that uh, for one pass SGD that you see in uh, the literature is, okay, but you never see samples more than twice anyway. Well, it's true, but actually seeing a sample twice is what's important for learning. So there is actually a, a, an advantage of non-single pass SGD over single pass SGD, even though you only see uh, the samples at most twice. And so you might want to ask, okay, what remains actually hard to learn? And I was, as I was saying, for single index, not so much if you don't want to get into very contrived uh, settings. For multi-index, though, there's still something hard to learn that is uh, quite intuitive. It's the so-called uh, parity problem, which is just uh, I take the product of my input and then the sign. And you can show that this is still, this is still uh, generative index k, exactly k, so the number of my inputs, which means that uh, it's actually not too bad because it means that I don't violate a lot of uh, lower bounds for learning parities. So I, I'm not completely uh, blowing open uh, the, com the complexity theory for parities, so it's good. It's actually quite kind of a sanity check. And so to conclude, the main uh, selling point that I want to uh, 
put emphasis on is that uh, the single pass HDD, all the results are especially in a hardness for single pass HDD, it's actually very brittle. It's not something that is uh, practical because seeing an example twice is enough to completely change what happens the second time you see it. Because you have this kind of memory inside the Ws. And uh, we also think it's probably also true for just inputs that are uh, significantly correlated with uh, the data, which is a filter direction that we want to, uh, to explore, which means that, for example, if you have uh, many closed images, I mean, at least you have images that differ by like a few pixels. Uh, I saw a result that said that in Cypher 10 you have like 10% of uh, near duplicates. And so, it is something that actually already happens in your data sets. Even though you're doing single pass over the data set, you're kind of seeing this kind of correlated inputs. And so, this uh, single pass HDD negative results should be uh, completely uh, in, uh, inefficient, in, inapplicable, let's say, in these settings. And uh, I thank you for your attention. I hope that uh, the two articles, so the one on the batches and the one on uh, SAM, will be up by the end of the month. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was really nice. Really great start to the conference. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions, so uh, fire away. I see the first one over here. Let me just... Yes. Uh, so I wanted to ask about this intuition at the end about mm -hmm. uh, if you don't do one pass, seeing a sample twice is, uh, gives you a lot more information. Uh, do you still expect this to be true even if you have to wait a really long time to see the, the sample again? So uh, it's something that we are uh, doing simulations about. It's very interesting. Like you, let's say that you have a big uh, pass. You, let's say that you have a function with information exponent two, okay? And you have a batch of size d. So uh, the first thing you do is well, do one pass over your whole batch. You don't learn because it's information exponent two. You don't have enough uh, samples. The second time you go over, you learn. So even though you're doing like this kind of uh, cycling through your data, you can show that like the first batch you see no progress in your loss, but something is happening so that the second time you go through the batch, this time you have improvement in your loss. Very interesting, thank you. Thank you for the questions. Uh, let me go around for another question. I wanted to ask about the loss function. So mm -hmm. for uh, this holds for uh, square and correlation loss. If you change the loss and maybe you don't have this linear dependence on y, does it, could it, could it improve? So uh, changing the loss is having, is indeed having some weird effects. Uh, the main answer is uh, for every loss that you choose, you're really gonna have some kind of hard functions. And so uh, then it's gonna be like a different class of hard functions. Uh, the problem is that in a lot of cases, except for this kind of uh, square correlation, this class of hard function is hard to uh, characterize. So it's hard to just say, okay, this function is a difficult function to learn for this loss. I mean, fortunately, for regression, it's not too much of a problem because you usually have a plethora of losses for uh, classification. You have cross entropy, you have exponential losses, etc. Classification is usually much more uh, classical in the loss that we choose. So that's why the, the square loss is usually enough for, uh, for regression tasks. But it's true that if you wanted to go through uh, classification tasks, you need to rethink a lot because, okay, first, uh, there is no uh, objective, there is no target function anymore, but also because it's probably going to be very dependent on the, uh, the, the loss that you use. Inba. One question about the reuse of the data, because the algorithm, the look-ahead algorithm mm -hmm. that you used, didn't use uh, reuse of data, or I didn't understand. So that I think I, I lost you there. Um, is this, here you're reusing data or not? Yes. Okay. I'm reusing data, but uh, basically it's just that each step is uh, the equivalent of two steps of SGD with the same data. You see that I have this W tilde, which is one step, and then I do a new step with, with uh, W tilde and the same data. I see, okay, okay, nice. Okay. Technically, it's a bit different because uh, uh, an actual two steps of GD would be a W tilde in here as well. Mm -hmm. 
but it's just uh, for simplicity, we just keep this WT. It depends on exactly like, I mean, the class of look ahead is a whole uh, class of algorithms, and some use WT, some use W, so we choose the simplest one to study. But, but it still that you, your step is very large. Uh, no, in here, in here or not? Since, I'm, since I'm single sample, my step is not going to be large. Uh, it's going to be a further one over D. Okay. okay, nice, thank you. We have another question, I think, there. And then Dave. So, thanks for the talk. It was very intuitive. Uh, as I understood, now you're randomly samples, sampling inputs, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering if you can do better. So imagine you know the teacher, you know where the, the weights of the teacher, mm -hmm. can you come up with a cl clever uh, picking of samples? That, so what is the best you can do if you can pick the samples cleverly? Um, it's a good question. I guess it would be a completely different uh, problem because uh, all these kind of information experiment, genetic experiment, etc., they are very dependent on the teacher, the, the, the inputs being Gaussian. I mean, it's just based on the Hermit decompositions of uh, functions. And so if I was allowed to choose my input according to a different distribution, I guess it would always be possible to choose a distribution that is like nice enough to me so that uh, I can learn uh, quite fast. That makes sense. Thanks, a great talk. Um, so I was wondering, so you suggested that the, if you have a bunch of like inputs that are correlated with one another, that could have a similar effect to showing the same input multiple times. Um, but it could be possible, like in the example of flip symmetry, like you said, that the inputs are closely related, but at the pixel level at least, they're like completely uncorrelated. Um, so would any benefit you get from this effect go away, or is there a sense in which like if you have multiple inputs that are sort of related, but by some kind of transformation, then you can still get some kind of benefit from this? I guess uh, in our setting, I would say no, because since we actually store uh, along the, we know that we deterministically the direction that we store them along is the input x. If you are uh, not independent but uncorrelated, I guess you're still going to have to do scalar products at some point, so uh, you're, you're going to lose this kind of uh, dependency. We have very time for one last question, if there's still. So this one, yes, great. Uh, thank you, Ludovic. So you said that this is, if you just look at the same sample like twice in a row, mm -hmm. it's pretty much the same as just doing like two passes over the data. Is that what you said earlier? If you see, or is it important that you see them right one after the other and you have some moment like? It, no, it's, impor yeah. it's important uh, theoretically, mm -hmm. of course. But uh, what we are seeing in simulations is that it shouldn't be that important uh, in practice. I guess it's dip, it, dip, it depends a lot on uh, whether, usually your data are kind of, if you look at at least uh, Gaussian data, they're going to be basically all of the same. But, uh, so basically seeing a, f a few inputs in between your repetitions is not going to change much because they're going to be in almost orthogonal directions to the one that uh, you will see twice. Then if you have, of course, uh, this kind of highly correlated data, I guess it's going to depend a bit on uh, whether you see them uh, close to each other or not. Okay, so the because like, the, the, the direction of the memory will be a bit uh, modified when you see a new input. Okay, thank you very much. All right, then let's thank Ludovic again. <laughs>